Okay, you welcome to this channel once again. My name is Akinwale Akindia. Okay, I'll be speaking today on our 31,000 risk management uh, principles. And uh, I will explain the basic uh, considerations uh, about uh, those uh, principles of risk management as um, explained by as noted in ISO 31000 uh, standard, that is clause four of the standard. The clause four of the standard talks about uh, the various uh, uh, principles in risk management. And for candidates of uh, risk uh, management uh, certification uh, uh, exams, like the uh, ISO 31000 risk manager, ISO 31000 lead risk manager. Uh, I will also give some test questions so on these uh, risk management principles. So uh, people that have been writing these exams, including myself, you know, I've always come across questions on principles. And the way the questions are set, is that uh, the you'll be given a scenario and you'll be told to identify which of the principles is uh, applicable in that particular scenario uh, basically so so you have to understand the concepts then you have to be able to identify the particular principle in a given scenario okay so uh, I'm going to explain, like I said, I'm going to explain uh, what the principles are. Okay, so this is, I extracted this from the standard, the same as the 12,000 standard. The principles provided, provide guidance on the characteristics of effective and efficient risk management, communicating its value and explaining its intention and purpose. So the essence of the principles is to guide us on effective risk management and efficient risk management. Effective, achieving the intended outcome. Efficient, achieving the intended outcomes with optimum resources. That's efficiency. Okay, so the principles are the foundation for managing risk and should be considered when establishing the organization's risk management framework and processes. What the standard is saying there is that th these are the basics, all right? So like in the military, all right, join the ministry, uh, they join the military, you know, they have this, uh, you know, school, all right? Um, you know, they call it the basics, you know, just the, go for basic training, all right? So the basic training, you know, what it takes to essential issues, essential keys, um, uh, attributes or skills that maybe an infantry person should have. Of course, there will be further training later, of course, as we progress in the military. But the, that one is the basic school, the foundation. So the same thing here. So this, these are basics for us in uh, enterprise risk management. So this is the foundation we are building on, okay? And they said, uh, whatever structure you want to set up, whatever risk management framework you want to set up, whatever risk management process you want to set up, you should consider these uh, principles, these eight principles. All right, so the essence of the principle is basically to manage your risk. That is the effect of uncertainty or your corporate objectives. So, so these, are the, these, are the basic, these are the principles, eight of them. Uh, the, the essence of all these risk management initiatives and everything is value creation and protection of value, all right? So risk management is, 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 is meant to help you to create value and is meant to also help you to protect the value you have created, okay? So we talk about, so you can see the eight of them uh, in that cycle. Integrated, structured, and comprehensive, customized, inclusive, dynamic, best available information, human cultural factors, 
the continual improvement. Okay, so, so let's look at each of the principles one by one. All right, so principle number one, is the risk management should be integrated. All right, that is risk management should be an integral part of all organizational activities. All right, so the I always say in risk management classes that that is the ultimate of risk management. In fact, that is why you set up an ERMD department division. All right, so enterprises management department division group. All right, whatever taxonomy you are using in your organization, the risk management function itself. All right, is not it does not actually carry out risk management. All right, that is the truth. The overall objective of setting up a risk management department is to be able to coordinate risk management activities in the organization, to be able to bring risk management to the table of everybody in the organization, regardless of their department. So every decision is being filtered through through the you know the kaleidoscope of of risk management, regardless of the department, regardless of the unit, regardless of what they do. All right. So the job of the risk management department or the risk management function is to make everybody in the organization to think risk. All right. To be risk conscious. So they're working with the process owners, they're working with the asset owners, they're working with the risk owners, they're working with senior management, all right, to make all of us, to filter our decisions through risk, through risk management. And so integrated me, risk management should be inculcated, should be engraved into the key activities of the organization, key activities of departments, key activities of units. That's integrated. All right, the, the second principle is that risk management should be structured and should be comprehensive. And uh, we can relate that to you know, capability maturity model. All right, integrated, all right, so you know, same MI, you know, so we talk about an organization be on level one, be on level two, level three, level four, level five, optimize, level four, quantitatively manage, all right? And so on, all right? Uh, level three, defined, level two, manage, uh, level one, ad hoc or initial. So the higher an organization goes in the capability majority model integration, all right, the more structured they become, the more comprehensive they become, the more repeatable they become, the more predictable they become, all right, the more repeatable their processes will become. And that's the ultimate. So we don't want a, we don't want a reactive approach to risk management. We don't want a, you know, we, we don't want an initial, a doc approach. So the essence is that we need to be able to formalize the risk management processes in the organization. All right, uh, one of the steps, first step towards that is uh, to have documentations, all right? So we have, we have uh, risk management policies, risk management manual, Right, we have uh, pro policies, documents to manage risk, ISMS, BCMS policy, B ISMS policy, all right, service management policies, okay? We have quality manuals, okay? Then, like I said, you know, uh, level four, qualitatively managed. So we have KPIs, we have risk KRIs, key risk indicators. We have risk, we have key performance indicators to track our performance capability and to also track 
all right, the the risks in the organization. So we have leading key, key risk indicators. We have lagging key risk indicators. We have automated tools, all right, to detect and to manage risk in the organization. So, so structural and compressive means, so what you do as an organization to make your risk management process, all right, repeatable, comparable, all right, predictable. So it says that to do with maturity, it has to do with capability, all right, of your, of your risk management framework and processes, all right. So, uh, third one is customized. Uh, what that is saying is that you know, risk management in Nigeria cannot be risk management in in US. It cannot, all right. Uh, risk management is uh, is contextual, all right. So if you look at the risk management process clause six, all right, you will see at the beginning of that risk management process. So you are going to see context, right? You're going to see scope, context, and criteria, all right? If you look at the ISOs also, 27,001, 2 20,000, 9 14,001, all of those are with those four, context of the organization, right? And so that's talking about the fact you cannot, you can't solve my problem if you don't know me, right? So you go to, you know, maybe you go to a, a medical doctor, say this guy is the best, all right, in the world, in his, in his or her field. And you go and meet the doctor, and the doctor says, okay, you should sit down, you sat down, doctor look at you for like five minutes and then you just wrote prescription drugs. I said, please go to the pharmacy and, you know, get these drugs, because... You ask questions. <laughs> it's your life, man. You're going to ask questions, all right? <laughs> he didn't ask me about my symptoms. He didn't ask about, you know, what, what the baby we had, there was pain or whatever. Then the next thing you're writing, you know, you'll feel confused, right? And I'm sure you will not, you, would, you won't go to the pharmacy to get those. Why? Because you expect the doctor to be able to get certain information from you to be able to make conclusions. And so in the same vein, for you to actually set up risk management, process of framework for an organization, you need to know the peculiarities of the challenges they are facing. So you need to know the external context, you need to know the internal context of, of the organization. And that's why I said the coping rights in, uh, let's assume a, a fintech in Nigeria and a fintech in US, they, they are in the same industry, all right, but the external environment, all right, external environment is not the same. Internal factors will not be the same. So whatever risk management uh, process or framework we're going to establish we need to look at the peculiarity of the organization. We need to customize. We need to create a risk management system that is just, you know, suitable, all right, for to meet the peculiar risks in the organization. So that's what that is saying. Uh, D, the fourth principle is talking about inclusive. Risk management should be inclusive. All right, so, so what this means is that, you know, with our stakeholders, we will not go far. <laughs> All right, we will not go far, you know, with our stakeholders. So we need the stakeholders, we need their views, all right? We need their commitment, we need their contributions, all right, throughout the risk management life cycle. And like I always say in risk management classes, See, <laughs> the department you ignore, or the set of people you ignore in your organization, all right, they are the ones that will be the source of problem for that organization. <laughs> I can give case studies, but for now, I will not, all right? But, so, but essentially what I'm trying to say is that, so let us assume you ignore your, maybe your cleaners, all right? You ignore the cleaners and say, okay, well, who are they, you know? Let's focus on, you know, <laughs> you know, certain keep certain set of people in the organization, right? Because those cleaners were not onboarded into your risk management uh, uh, framework and process, all right? They become source of risk to you, all right? So they, they number one, they can 
easily, you know, we have what we call, uh, you know, social engineering. So they can be easily deceived, all right, by an outsider that, know, that knows that they're working with your organization. And you can just go and ask them some, some seemingly naive questions or seemingly harmless questions, which could mean a lot, all right, which could result into a loss in your organization. So, so for some, so for so many companies, they are ignoring the IT guys, the people that you know, students that came to do IT, all right, students that you know, uh, interns, all right, uh, contract staff, all right, vendor staff, okay, vendor staff, and so on, all right. In Nigeria, we have youth coppers. All right, so in Nigeria, you have youth coppers. So where these youth coppers are, and these are graduates, basically. These are graduates already. Uh, so with varying backgrounds. And uh, these graduates join to serve their nation, maybe for one year, you know, some of these companies are people just like, it's a copper or she's a copper, you know. So they, they kind of exclude, you can just exclude them, they will soon go, all right? But, but, but there have been cases of if this, um, people you think cannot really harm the organization, all right? Uh, there have been cases of some of them, because of where they were coming from, all right? Some of them are very, very much, you know, have, they have certain capabilities and certain motivations. All right, and like they say in ethical hacking, all right, what an ethical hacker actually basically needs, you know, you know, are those two things, all right? You know, the motivation and the capabilities. So when those two are there, it does not matter whether the person is a copper, whether the person is a cleaner, whether the person is an, an intern, whether the person is a contract staff, all right, a casual worker. <laughs> Doesn't matter the department, that person is still going to hit you, especially when that person is within your system. All right. So what am I saying, or what is the standard saying here? You must include as many stakeholders as possible in your risk management net. All right. It's, it's just important. You just have to do it. Okay. For your sake, for their sake, <laughs> for the organization's sake. All right, so you might just look at a group of people and say they are harmless, all right, but they can be the most dangerous to your organization. I remember I read about, you know, I read about, you know, a particular um, hacking that happened in one bank. The, the hackers were trying to hack their organization and they, from our side, they could not, they did all their best, but man, the logical security for that company was too, too, Good. They couldn't break it. They couldn't break it. So those guys realized they wouldn't be able to break from outside. So what did they do? They noticed that you know cleaners in that bank, of course, cleaners have access to everywhere. All right, everywhere. Cleaners can go everywhere. So they discovered that the cleaners can easily move around. So they, they look at uh, so they were able to embed themselves among those cleaners. All right. Uh, the story did not mention how that happened, but they did it. So they embedded themselves among the cleaners, and that was how they were able to breach the bank's uh, security. So, but luckily for the bank, you know, they had what we call, you know, layer defense, layer defense. Some textbooks call it defense in depth. So, which means if the attacker breaches breach one wall, it means another one breaches that. It means another one breaches that. So, you know, like we say in Nigeria, now you go tire. So that was exactly what saved that bank. But they were breached. But the layer defense saved them. The layer defense saved them. All right? But really, it would have been possible to even hit them at all, if not that they were breached through the, through the cleaners. All right? And that's just one case study. That's just one case study. All right, of uh, being a little bit negligent about a set of people or a particular unit or a particular department or a particular stakeholder in the 
organization when you are planning your risk management uh, system, process or framework for your organization. Okay, so I'm, I'm really, you know, encouraging us, all right, so based on these inclusive principles, principle as much as as much as possible in, include as many people as possible as many departments as many line manager right as many stakeholder internal and external right when you are uh, implementing your risk management framework and process okay so the fifth one is that risk management should be dynamic all right so the SNA environment is this volatile the internal environment is volatile. Even our data is volatile, right? One of the key, the one of the Vs of, of big data, all right? The high volume, right? High velocity, right? And high volatility. So everywhere is just boom, 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 boom. Everywhere is, everywhere is, everything is changing so fast. Okay, everything is changing so fast. So uh, technologies are changing, laws are changing, all right? So we need to, customer taste, because of societal trends are changing. So because of those changes, so, so you will be very naive, all right, to also uh, be static. So, so no matter how good your defenses are, no matter how your good risk management efforts, initiatives are, all right, the time will make them obsolete. That's all the truth. Time will make basically render them obsolete. So we need to we need to keep updating, all right, uh, our risk management initiatives as as times as as needed, all right, uh, as dictated by changes in the SNI environment and changes in our internal context. That's five. The fifth one, dynamic. The sixth one is risk management is, is based on best available information. All right. Uh, I used to say it that you know risk management is basically information management, actually. Basically, that's what we're doing. All right. So now you are gathering information from the past, or you are gathering information from the present, or you are gathering information from even the future, trend management, right? Trend management. So the, the best, the, the more equipped you have, you have. With, with information, relevant information, then the more you are able to manage risk. That does it. All right. Look at, look at for example, look at the stock exchange. The people who are making money on, on stock trading are the people who have <laughs> the right information. That does it. Who can predict the movement of the markets based on certain information right at their disposal okay so best available information risk management is is based on the information you have all right look at look at uh, 2020 when there was lockdown all right few organizations could have predicted that there will be global lockdown but some organizations were, were following the trends all right following the trend right from you know the first outbreak of that of that uh, of that uh, um, disease, all right, that later became the global pandemic, all right. So some some of some organizations were able to follow the trend, and some could even predict, all right, uh, from the way things were going that there might there might likely be some short some sort of lockdown, and some of them were prepared. All right, maybe not as fully as if I wanted to, but some were quite prepared to an extent. And it reflected, all right, on those who survived the pandemic and businesses that did not. All right, so uh, as an organization, you have to keep on striving to have, you know, information that are needed for decision making when it comes to risk management. All right, then the uh, next one is human and cultural factors. So what that is saying is that no, no, no matter the, all right, the, um, your investments, okay, in, in risk management. So you have done your risk identification, you have done analysis, 
they have done evaluation. All right, even the evaluation, for example, look at risk identification. That there are a lot of human and cultural factors involved. That's why you see when you are in risk management classes, they will teach you bias. All right, so people are biased. All right, anchoring and the rest of them. So once some people have believed something, that does it. So you have group bias also. So when you know a particular department, a particular age group, you know. Once they have decided this is to, this is where they are going, you can't change it, all right? So a lot of bias come, comes up during this identification because of who we are, all right? Why is it that some people do stunts? <laughs> they, get, they, get, they get a kick out of doing stunts. Why somebody, so as they are doing those stunts and they're having fun, somebody is raising his hand upon his head and like shouting. Like literally, his heart is in his mouth, like they say. All right. So one is having fun. The other one is shrieking. Basically, what's this? This guy is playing with his life. Why? Is is basically those two sets of people are coming from different backgrounds. So what gives them a high is differs. And we also talk about risk perception. All right, in risk management, risk perception. So somebody sees something as high risk, and that one sees that, oh, no, what, what are you talking about? This is just normal. <laughs> All right, so risk identification. Somebody say this is this risk is can happen to us. And I would say, no, 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 it cannot. All right. All right, I've even been in a situation whereby somebody said, we are praying. All right, I'm not I'm not against prayers, of course. <laughs> I believe so much in prayers, but you know, but sometimes it also shows, you know, people are not able to make objective decisions. All right, because somebody is saying we are praying. And why am I raising this? Why am I raising this? Because to just to show that you know human factors affect risk management. We can argue to tomorrow in a particular it's whether it can happen in our organization or not. So even when we finally pass identification, we go to analysis. Somebody is saying the risk is high. Another one saying the risk is the likelihood. Okay. Somebody saying the likelihood is high. So another person saying the likelihood is medium. We can spend all the arguing that. All right. Then even when that we get evaluation, it becomes another issue. All right. So we now have the result of the risk analysis. Let's make decision on this risk. Is this a risk we can look away from? A risk we cannot look away from. That's what we do in the evaluation. You compare the result of risk analysis with the result with your risk appetite, with your risk criteria, with you know your risk manual, risk policy, with the law, all right, with regulations. That's what you do. <laughs> it's supposed to be a straightforward activity, but it's not. We all know it's not. And that's why businesses die, because people make mistakes, all right? They make decisions only in this evaluation that they should not have made. So you see people accepting risk. They're not supposed to accept. <laughs> and the risk evaluation stays. So, no, 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 it's there's no problem. But wait, there's problem. There's problem. So like I normally say in risk management classes, all right, risk can be accepted, you know, ignorantly. They didn't know. All right, which is still woman also. It's also woman and cultural factor. All right, risk can be accepted, you know, ignorantly. They didn't you know. Risk can be accepted negligently. They were careless. Maybe if they have asked more questions, maybe if they have done more researches, maybe, all right, they will not have accepted that risk. All right, there are case studies <laughs> all over the world, all right, on these decisions. So you can just... You know, you can just Google corporate failures, all right? You see a lot of reasons why so many businesses fail, all right? So risk can be accepted negligently. And sometimes risk can be accepted criminally. That's also human and cultural. So people who are making decisions that will, that will negate business objective or but might probably line, you know, personal pockets. Yeah, it happens in reality and that is the truth. Okay, so so people make decisions that is going to arm the organization and you know you know increase their own personal bank accounts. 
rights or status or whatever. So you, you cannot ignore man culture and cultural factors. What about things like, uh, uh, what do they call this now? So if people collude, collusion. <laughs> so you have the best firewalls, you have the best <laughs> symptoms, right? And so on. You have the best information security, all right, and all, all manner of uh, physical security, and you know, that's so all. But still, things will still go, but still go wrong when people agree for one reason or the other, all right. So you have a maker and the checker, the maker and the checker both agreed to defraud the bank. That's woman, that's cultural. So, what do you do about that? So, so what we're saying is that you know, in all as you are. Uh, you know, implementing the other, you know, tech aspects of risk management, process aspect of risk management, uh, and so on. You need to also keep your eyes on your people. So people are our greatest assets. They are also our greatest risk, right? Uh, in our in our in, in our efforts to secure uh, and sustain our organization. So. Uh, then the last one is continuous improvement. So you have to keep on learning and relearning, all right? So uh, it's fine and good. Can you be better? Yes. That is what that is saying. So we need to continue to scan our risk management projects, programs, process, framework for areas of improvement. I talk about the capability maturity model, integration, the other time. So you need to be able to do regularly do gap assessment. Where are you? Where do you want to be? Where are you supposed to be? Are we on level three? Can we move to level four? Are we on level four? Can we move to level five? Are we on level five? All right. So we have to keep on improving ourselves. So we are not sleeping. Okay. So that is basically what continuous improvement is all about. So these are the eight principles, okay, of uh, risk management according to us at Okay. So for those of us that are writing exams, what to write the lead risk manager, or I want to write the risk manager uh, certification. So I've, I've created some test questions uh, to show us how questions on risk management principles can be set and what you are supposed to do to know what you are talking about. So you'll be expected to identify the applicable risk management principle in this scenario. Okay, so let's go. Tecra Limited was a leading uh, company in the oil and gas industry. In January 2022, Tecra Limited acquired Risk Limited, a key player in the downstream sector. Being the acquirer, Tecra Limited retained its business continuity strategies and plans and continued to apply them to the pools, major entity without any significant changes. Yeah, since they are the acquirer. So the Jeffers, they can just you know, continue uh, the way they've been doing things, why not? So months after the acquisition, series of extended downtime were being experienced uh, by the enlarged entity, resulting in loss of some major contracts. So that, so question, which risk management principle was not applied by Tech and Limited A? human and cultural factors, B, best available information, C, dynamic. So out of the eight, which one do you think is not, is not, they didn't apply? So clearly here they said there was a merger. They were doing well before the merger. So there was now a merger with another key player, all right? So which means that the, the acquiry too uh, was a key player in the industry. So now we have a bigger tech uh, now, we have a bigger tech car. But the challenge was that they were using, they still retained the old business continuity strategy they were using and plans they were using before. So obviously those business continuity strategies and plans were added, you know, they are already obsolete, obviously. That was why you know, almost immediately after the acquisition, they started experiencing breakdown, all right? They started expressing that time. So clearly, if you look at it very well, the problem here is that they did not apply the risk management principle of dynamism. So the moment they, they acquire that um, that company, all right, they're supposed to 
you know, reassess the business continuity strategies and plans and update it immediately. All right, because the environment has changed. So the, the answer is, is dynamic, all right? The risk management was not dynamic. So that was a problem. Okay, so let's look at another question. Okay, Raise Bank PLC was a national bank with hundreds of branches across the nation. In 2023, the bank created a fraud prevention unit, FPU, with the objective of minimizing the incident and impact of frauds within the bank. The FPU started its operations by creating a database of known frauds that have been attempted in the bank, successful and failed. All right, and spent weeks studying the contributing factors. All right, the FPU then created a framework of people, processes, and technologies to prevent further frauds in the bank. So question, which risk management principle was applied by the fraud prevention unit? Inclusive, best available information, dynamic. Okay, so if you look at the approach of these uh, fraud prevention units, they were basically building on historical information. That's the approach they use. So, okay, the fraud that's happened in, in, in this branch at the time, they collected information, got the facts of that fraud, determined what led to the fraud, what vulnerabilities, all right, uh, led to it, who were the key players and so on. And so they, they, they created a database like that. And based on that, they knew what have happened in the past. So they started creating, all right, framework to ensure that those identified fraud uh, um, methodologies does not happen in the bank again. So basically, it's, it's, you can see it's basically big. So they, they are basing, they are building their that risk management uh, uh, framework on information that is that are already available to them. All right. So based on those information, they are now making decisions for the future. So the best answer here is B. All right. Best available information. Okay, Tight Chemical Limited is a detergent making company that is also involved in producing heavy chemicals for several manufacturing companies. The risk manager observed that there have been a surge of occupational hazards in the last two quarters with several employees injured and equipment damaged. A root cause analysis of the observations showed that there was lukewarm interest in health and safety controls by junior and middle level employees due to lack of motivation, choice to poor remunerations. All right, so uh, question, which risk management principles should be applied by Thais Chemical Limited? A, human and cultural factors, B, best available information, C, continual improvement. If you look at the scenario, the problem was this, all right? Lukewarm interest. So there were controls, obviously, <laughs> but, but nobody cared. Nobody was, nobody was bothering about those controls because people are not happy coming to work. They were demotivated because of uh, the poor salary they were collecting. So they just come to the work, to work just for the sake of coming and collecting a paycheck, not necessarily to add value. So, so the, that company need to work on, on the psyche of its workers need to see what they need to do to, to reverse that trend so that people can come to work motivated. So whatever you are going to do, if you don't consider this human and cultural factor, all right, then the risk management initiatives might fail. So the best answer in this scenario actually is A. And the best answer in this scenario is A. All right, Ajax. Okay, Ajax Insurance Limited has just implemented 61,000. The scope of the implementation focus on the profit centers with management believing that risk management should be priority only for the cash cow departments. All right, by focusing only on the profit centers, Ajax Insurance Limited has breached the risk management principle of DASH. A, human and cultural factors, customized, inclusive. All right, so you can see clearly here, they want to focus their risk management efforts just on profit centers. So what about the cost centers, all right? So you are not, you are not, so you are making profits, but you are not, risk management 
is not applied in call centers, what, what would that lead to? You can have procurement fraud. <laughs> procurement department is not a call, it's not a profit center, right? But they can sink an organization if, if it's not controlled, if it's not managed, all right? So you can have procurement fraud, right? Yeah. And so cost, you are making money, but cost is es escalating with it. So at the end of the day, the company might, might, might be making losses, even though you are earning it so easily, because expenses are not controlled. So they were wrong, all right? By limiting the scope of the risk management uh, framework to just the cash card department. So the, the problem here, the, what the, the risk management principle they bridge is, is inclusiveness. Right, inclusiveness. So the answer is C. So you see how easy it is. So you need to understand those principles. So when you look at a scenario, you'll now be able to judge which of the principles is applicable. Okay, Gen2 Engineering Limited is a multinational company with presence in 26 countries. The company is compliant with the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. However, some of the countries in which Gen2 Engineering Limited is operating has passed local privacy laws, which have some provisions that were not in GDPR, all right? So uh, those other countries, look at uh, look, those other countries, they now have their own laws, all right? So the management of Gen2 Engineering Limited directed all the offices worldwide to maintain compliance with GDPR and perform gap analysis with local privacy laws. This will ensure that the company meets local privacy regulations while meeting the requirements of GDPR. So this is quite straightforward. Management says, yes, implement GDPR, but do gap analysis with local privacy laws and see areas of gap and ensure we address those gaps. So that is basically what the management said there. So which of the following risk management principles was applied by Gentle Engineering Limited? Uh, a, human and cultural factors, B, customized, C, inclusive. So definitely the answer here, all right, is customized, all right? The answer is B. So they, they have customized the, you know, uh, that law, all right? They've customized that, you know, the GDPR implementation or our compliance, all right, to the local requirements, of the countries they are working in. So you can just say that, you know, we are GDPR compliant, fine. But in XYZ country where you are operating, all right, they have another law, all right, and your com company is also expected to be compliant to that particular law. So you have to customize, all right, uh, or, you know, your, your, your compliance, all right? You have to customize it such that you are able to meet the GDPR, which is international law, and you are also able to meet the external legal requirement. Of course, law is from the external, external context. So you are able to also ensure that that, that uh, gap assessment you did all right, between GDPR and local law is a form of customization. All right, so you now know, okay, this particular law requires us to do this, do this, in, you know, maybe in to use a particular encryption technology or uh, encryption um, algorithm that was not mentioned in GDPR. So you identify the gap and address it. So that way you have made GDPR, you have also made local laws. All right, so that will be my customization. So the answer there is B, okay? In 2023, Barnex Bank, PLC, I had a chief risk officer to replace the previous chief risk officer that recently retired. The new CRO observed that risk awareness training was conducted on a monthly basis. However, the CRO observed that only full-time employees were invited to the monthly risk awareness training. The contract employees and interns were given risk awareness training during the onboarding process. So which of the following risk management principles was not applied by Barnes Bank PLC? A, dynamic, B, customized, C inclusive. So the, the answer to this is very clear, right? So uh, the so the money awareness training, like we said, they didn't include the contract employees, they didn't include the interns, all right, which is a risk. So they just felt that you know that uh one-time onboarding awareness they've given them when they were joining the organization, 
that is enough. But we all know that is not enough. Awareness must be continuous. So cutting off the contract employees and interns from the Monday risk and awareness training, all right, is a breach of uh, the inclusiveness principle. So that means it's the, the risk management was not inclusive. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of this uh, presentation on uh, ISO 1000 lead risk management. So the essence of this, the essence of this uh, class, uh, this presentation is to be able to uh, provide for us the knowledge that is required in uh, uh, meeting the uh, understanding what is expected of us about uh, as 1000 risk management principles, what the principles are, uh, high level understanding of, of the concepts, and also uh, when we see a question on a risk management principle, right, how to be able to interpret it and how to be able to pick the best answer. So thank you so much. My name is Akinwale Akindia. All right. So um, this is the, so if you have not yet subscribed to this uh, channel, I encourage you to please do so. All right. So that to be able to also get alerts when I drop other um, educational videos on this channel. Thank you.